Good evening. I'd like to welcome everybody to this evening's Frontier of Geophysics lecture. Uh, before we get started with the Frontiers lecture, um, I would actually like to take this opportunity, um, because it's really the only one that we have in the meeting that is a public opportunity, um, for us uh, to be able to acknowledge the people who really make the meeting happen, which isn't um, the scientific uh, program committee, but it's the staff at AGU headquarters. So I would like to um, acknowledge Brenda Weaver, Joanna Ward, Melissa Markovitz, and many other people at AGU headquarters who do the things that would happen really badly if we had to do them. So thank you very much. So it's my great pleasure this evening to introduce Julia Slingo, Professor Julia Slingo, OBE, who is the um, Chief Scientist at the UK Met Office. She is a Professor of Meteorology at the University of Reading, um, and in her former life, before being at the UK Met Office, was the Director of the National Center for Atmospheric Sciences, um, which is housed at the University of Reading. In, in the UK. Julia's research is, uh, has been in a long career in climate modeling, particularly in some key um, aspects of atmospheric physics, for example, cloud radiation interactions. She's done an enormous amount of research looking at tropical weather and climate, um, their effects on global climate change and the impact on um, tropical, uh, the, the tropics of um, climate change itself, so looking at those interactions. She participated in the Stern Review on the Economics of Climate Change, and she is the first woman president of the Royal Meteorological Society. And um, on a personal note, it turns out that today is her birthday, so we're especially privileged. and grateful that she would take an hour of her day to come spend with us. So I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Catherine. Well, it is a great pleasure to be here and actually not such a bad thing to be doing on my birthday, talking about the subject that I love. Um, but the topic for tonight's fairly challenging and I looked at the title when I, that I'd given and thought, my goodness, how am I going to uh, cover all of this? in less than an hour and of course I'm not and um, so it will of course have a strong meteorological bent to it but I hope that by the end of tonight you'll see where I think the opportunities now lie for us to make serious progress in uh, being able to deal with our increasing vulnerability to natural hazards and the way in which we can bring all our science to bear on this really important problem. So what am I going to cover today? Well, as it's turned out, I think you could look at 2010 and say that it was an unprecedented year of geophysical hazards. Um, and I'll go through some of them in a minute. Um, and it really did, for me at least, challenge the way I think about how we communicate our meteorological science, how we take it through and really make a difference to people's lives uh, their well-being, their sustainability. I think it's important that we understand risk because what we're really talking about here, about here is risk and, and its relationship to geophysical hazards. And again, I've learned a lot about this in the last few years by working very closely with the insurance sector and particularly the Willis Research Network and trying to understand what does risk really mean. We talk about it in very loose terms, but actually it's incredibly challenging. I was asked originally uh, to come and talk to you about uh, AFEOCL, but um, did I get that right? I hope I did. <laughs> um, and of course, there's a lot to say about AFEOCL, and uh, I was in the thick of it as Chief Scientist of the Met Office, so I'll tell you a little bit about how we handled that crisis and actually what we learnt about how to really do cross-disciplinary geophysical hazard uh, warnings, science, etc. 
And then I'm going to revert to my uh, old love of meteorology and just give you a little glimpse of the latest progress we're making in predicting extreme events. Because if we look at most of these geophysical hazards, they either start with the weather or they're mediated by the weather. I think apart from earthquakes, it's very hard to think about of, of a geophysical hazard that doesn't have weather in it somewhere. And then just finally some, some comments to bring it all together in terms of risk-based assessments. So let's start with uh, this year. And we were barely into this year and I was just getting over actually climate gate in terms of uh, my work as chief scientist, when all of a sudden, Aofiokul went up, and this was its impact. It was massive. I think it is very interesting to look at the scale of these, now the impacts of these natural hazards on the way we live. So that was the first of them, and then as we got on into the summer, we saw the Pakistan floods, um, an incredible event, and we can see on the uh, uh, pictures here the extent of the flooding of the Indus River and indeed of the uh, large lake that t to the east of the mountains there. And it, was, it wasn't actually an unprecedented event. It was the worst flooding since 1929, but a lot of people, of course, affected. Uh, a huge loss of life, a uh, huge loss of crops, and uh, massive impact on Pakistan's expected growth. And not unrelated to the Pakistan floods, we of course had the Russian heat waves and wildfires, They're all tied up with the same pattern of weather. And, uh, and this one has to look at and say, was this an unprecedented event? And we'll come on to that later on. Worst drought since records began. Many active forest fires, record heat in Moscow, and again, huge impacts on um, particularly food and the sustainability of food supply. And then we had the Chinese summer floods and landslides. Again, probably tied up with the, or the same weather pattern. Um, but worse flooding in a decade, 25 rivers at record high levels. The Three Gorges Dam, which had only been recently completed, or near capacity and again huge impacts economically and societally and one perhaps that perhaps didn't catch your attention but actually is perhaps a warning of things to come the first significant space weather storm of the new solar cycle so we've been sitting here quite complacently for the last few years as our, growing de as our dependence on global communications has grown during solar minimum. And we're now going into solar maximum. And perhaps uh, this is one of these things that's out there, a bit like the Iceland volcano, that we need to be concerned about. Because a major solar storm would have a massive impact on global telecommunications, on our ability to uh, move around the planet, on the electricity supply potentially, on even our financial trading. Lots and lots of impacts, and perhaps this is, was, was the first of something significant. And then just closer to home, we've had another severe bout of weather following the weather we endured at the beginning of uh, 2010. Here we are at the end of 2010 in uh, very severe cold weather traffic chaos, um, warning of Christmas presents not being delivered in time for Christmas. A major problem. But nevertheless, this has become a pretty big issue and I've spent the weekend uh, talking to the government chief scientist about uh, this continuing cold and is this uh, something we're going to have to learn to live with in the next few years. Global warming? Maybe not. But anyway, what we learn from all of these when we look at 2010 and many of the others is that we are increasingly vulnerable in this interdependent environment in which we live. That very few of those catastrophes that I talked about are just, just involve meteorology. 
they, meteorology may be the beginning of them, but actually what we impacts us is, is meteorology plus something else. So if we look at the sorts of things that we are concerned about at the Met Office in terms of environmental hazards and the way we need to provide public warnings and so forth, then hydrometeorological events, flood, drought, landslides, waterborne pollutants, wildfires, marine and coastal infrastructures. So again, uh, the weather will be the driver, but the impacts will be felt by the response of the ocean and storm surges and so forth on the coast and marine structures. Airborne dispersion, um, the source of the, of, of the pollutant may be nothing to do with meteorology, but it's meteorology that disperses it and causes us problems. And we can go on further space weather events uh, affecting, as I've said, satellite communications, aviation, mining, electricity supply. But some of those, the impacts of space weather events will be felt through the interaction with our own atmosphere, with our ionosphere. So increasingly we think about what's called a sun to mud system. So the interaction of solar modeling of the sun with modeling of the Earth's atmosphere and particularly the ionosphere. Geological hazards, this is where we're a little bit further away from meteorology, but often the weather can actually exacerbate what is already a difficult situation. And finally, of course, climate variability and, cl and climate change and what all that means for our sustainability, our resilience and so forth. Uh, our well-being and uh, looking further ahead even things like our ability to uh, have a reliable source of green energy from renewable energy sources. So here we are in an increasingly uh, interdependent environment and all of this requires geophysics, the science, sciences of geophysics to interact so that we can actually provide the information that society requires. So let's just talk about risk here because I've, I focus there on just the natural hazard but actually what of course people really want to know is, is what does it mean to me and what action should I take and actually if you really want to get down to quantifying and reducing risk then you have a much more complex pathway uh, which involves our exposure, our vulnerability, those two together, what the socioeconomic impact is on us, and it's only that that allows us then to quantify and reduce the risk. And of course the insurance sector understand that very well, and we can learn a lot from them on how we sort of think about going from a natural hazard to what it means to us in terms of a risk for our livelihood and our, our well-being. But if we take this pathway and look at it in a little bit more, more detail, it's actually a very complex landscape. And what it's about is we've now got to start putting lots of pieces together. And uh, this is where it becomes very challenging. So we have extreme weather leads to a geophysical hazard. Likewise, we have climate variability and climate change, which changes the intensity and or frequency of extreme weather or the geophysical hazard. We need to understand that relationship. We need to understand our exposure and our vulnerability to these things. What's there? Then are there socioeconomic impacts? Are we talking at the global, regional or local level? The sort of science we'll need could be quite different. Are we talking about geophysical hazards and risk today, next year, next decade, next century. Does it require different science? And are we talking about preparedness? Are we talking about resilience? Are we talking about adaptation? These words all come up and it's, I think it's interesting to think whether they mean similar things or different things. I would argue that being prepared and being resilient to natural hazards today will allow us to adapt more effectively to natural hazards in the future, particularly as our climate changes. And finally, of course, we have to sit this in the framework of the much bigger global picture on climate change is the requirement for mitigation, the influence that has on policy and on the economics.
So all these are very interrelated problems when we think about geophysical hazards and managing risk. So it's a complex landscape, and I think very few of us have any idea how to pull this all together. And it's also a shifting landscape because uh, nothing is stationary in this world, certainly not the climate, and certainly not our exposure. We are changing where we live, so we, more of us live in cities on the coast. Uh, more of us live on rivers and so forth. And even if we were not changing where we live, we're more vulnerable because of how we live and our, in, our dependence on so much infrastructure. And I note here, this picture is the telecommunication structure, so we're more vulnerable. And our climate is changing. So we have also not only a complex landscape, but a shifting landscape. And finally, of course, we live in an uncertain world, and I think all of us as scientists are beginning to realize that there's never a single answer out there for any of these things. That as Ed Lorentz said so uh, eloquently in one of his paper in 1969, it's actually, it's, this is what he said, one flap of a seagull's wing may forever change the course of the weather. And of course, this has become deeply embedded in meteorology, in weather forecasting and climate prediction, this idea that there is not a single solution, that we live in a chaotic atmosphere, a chaotic ocean, and therefore uh, one flap of the seagull's wings may give us a different solution. So all, we, we all understand that we have to take a probabilistic view to prediction, but I would argue that that applies not only to the weather, but to many other aspects of geophysical science. And so we have to take these concepts of probability through into our modeling across the whole range of the sciences that we need to do to look at uh, the risks from geophysical hazards. And this is the sorts of ways that we represent uncertainty in our ensemble prediction systems in weather and climate prediction, but I think actually it carries through into uh, many other parts of the sciences that we need to look at, hydrology and so forth. That there are elements knowing where you're starting from, the initial condition uncertainty, of course we don't know that perfectly. And of course not, none of the models that we use are perfect, they cannot be. Because uh, we cannot resolve all the scales that are required to find, to obtain a deterministic solution. Um, and there are lots of parameters that we use to close the problem which themselves are uncertain. And we should be estimating that uncertainty every step of the way along the road from, say, the meteorological hazard through to the hydrometeorological and so forth. We have to have that propagation of uncertainty all the way through so that we can truly estimate the risk. And of course, it's not quite as simple as that because actually our climate is changing and the way in which we use our environment is changing. So, in a sense, we don't even now know what sort of phase space we're operating in. And that, I think, uh, we're already beginning to see in some of the work we're doing at, at the Met Office in our seasonal to decadal prediction activities, that we can't use previous forecasts, what we call hindcasts, to estimate skill. They're not necessarily representative of the uh, climate that we're, going to, we're trying to predict today let alone what we're trying to predict 10 years from now or 20 years from now. And I think the way forward with this is that um, the only way you can build confidence in your, your probabilistic prediction systems going forward when you know that, when you don't know the future climatology or the future state of the environment that you're trying to, to forecast is to do the best possible underpinning science, to have the the most confidence you can in the processes and phenomena that you're trying to model. And that takes us back to some really thinking about fundamentals. And it takes us back to observing and monitoring the system with as much uh, completeness as we possibly can. Because it's only by understanding the processes and the science that underpins our forecasts and our models that we can have confidence going forward.
So there we are. We've got a, a very complex landscape. And what I want to do in the uh, uh, rest of the talk is to uh, just go through some examples. And I'm going to start with Eofiyukul and use this to give you an example of actually a natural hazard that only had an impact because of our change in vulnerability. Uh, Eofiyukul was what I call an unusual volcano coupled with some pretty unfriendly meteorology. And if we look at the uh, statistics around Iceland volcanoes, well, this was nothing unusual. So this shouldn't have been an issue for us. But the pro it became an issue because Icelandic volcanoes have been unusually quiet over the period that aviation travel had blossomed. So we've been sitting there quite complacently flying around the world, not realizing that certainly on our doorstep in the UK was something that could cause us a lot of problems. Certainly we'd done work on Icelandic volcanoes, but we hadn't really done them in the con context of some pretty unfriendly meteorology. So we hadn't done a full risk assessment. So this wasn't an uncommon event, but we are increasingly vulnerable to things that are really quite run of the mill. So here we are with Air Fiocco, and uh, the problem with this particular volcano was that uh, it began to erupt in, in March, but uh, in April it erupted through the glacier. And at that point, um, you, you converted uh, a lot of water to a lot of steam, and it caused a lot of fragmentation of the ash. So what was emitted by the plume was a lot of very fine ash, and it was also uh, lofted to, to higher levels because of the interaction with the uh, glacier and the steam that ar arose from the melting of the glacier. So here we are with a fairly, not a standard volcano uh, in terms of what aviation is used to dealing with. But it also happened with, as I said, some pretty unfriendly meteorology. So on the 14th of April, here's the weather chart, and we can see that we've got a really very uh, strong high-pressure system to the west of the UK. The air is coming round uh, the top of that anticyclone, crossing over Iceland, curving round, and being brought back over the UK and being recirculated around that high-pressure system. I was called up very soon after this um, to say, what are we going to do about this? And I have to admit, I looked at the weather forecast and I thought, my goodness, we're in for a bit of a run here because there was no sign of this high pressure system breaking down for about a week. So we were looking at some pretty serious situation if this volcano continued to erupt, which it did. So what about, um, why, why was this a problem? So we were under a lot of pressure as to why was this so difficult? And the other point is that, yes, Iceland has these unusual volcanoes, but also the North Atlantic has some unusual weather regimes. It has this unique weather pattern called the North Atlantic Oscillation, which is shown here. And what we were in during uh, April and into May this, this year was a very strong negative phase of the North Atlantic Oscillation. If you look at the classic description of this, particularly on the lower panel, you will see that uh, the jet stream makes a wonderful excursion north and then down over Iceland, straight down over the UK. So we were in the firing line. Uh, the ash was going to be carried straight from Iceland right over the UK and into Western Europe. And what's interesting is that on the, uh, the other smaller panels show you the sea surface temperature patterns that are typically associated with these longer period variations in the North Atlantic Oscillation. And what we had indeed this, this spring was a pattern very reminiscent of the uh, warm, cold, warm tripole that you can see on the lower panel there. So we were in a period actually of um, more frequent negative NAO patterns than we would normally expect. And we can see that if we look back even through uh, the time series, through the sequence of this eruption, we had negative uh, NAO blocking weather patterns right through February, March, associated with 
um, a rather cold winter again that we had and then these return with a vengeance around the 14th of April and carried on right through until the beginning of June. And it was this unfriendly meteorology that caused us so much problems, so many problems. Um, which again is not typical of what the aviation industry have to deal with when they deal with volcanoes in other parts of the world. Usually the ash is just blown away uh, and that's the end of it. And usually, of course, it's not as fine ash, so it gets dropped out quite quickly, quite close to the volcano. So we were dealing with something that was really unprecedented in far, as far as the experience of the aviation industry was concerned and also the engine manufacturers who were the key part, key player in a lot of this. So the volcano goes off, there are volcanic ash advisory centers and uh, we have a responsibility in London for what looks like quite a small sector but it takes in the volcanoes of Iceland and although it's not drawn very well some of the other ones uh, further south. But um, the point here is that if a volcano is in your sector, that ash belongs to you even if it leaves your sector. So uh, <laughs> there we were. We couldn't get rid of it. So it was our business even when it inter went into the Montreal vac or into the Toulouse vac. But it did mean we, we, had, we worked very, very closely with the other vacs that were affected. So what's, what do we do? Well, when we issue a volcanic ash advisory service, well, it starts, of course, with knowing what the winds are. And uh, so it's a forecasting problem. We take the observations, many of you will be familiar with this, uh, feed them into a weather prediction model, produce a four-dimensional view of the winds, the rainfall, the temperatures. All of these are important, actually, because it's not just the winds that matter. Uh, the ash is washed out by rainfall, it's lofted by uh, vertical motions associated with temperature gradients. And uh, in this particular inc inc incident, of course, there was no rain, it was anticyclonic, so that didn't help us either. But normally that would also be part of the calculation. And then you take the meteorology and you take what you know about the volcanology and feed it into a dispersion model. The volcanology, of course, is where the tricky things come in. We need to know the mass, how much ash is coming out of this volcano, what height is it being injected into the atmosphere, what's the size of the particles. Um, all these things are very difficult to know. Um, and out of that comes what is the classic VAC advisory, which just says this is the boundary between ash and no ash. It doesn't say anything about how much ash, it just says this is where you should not fly. Keep away from the zone with ash in. At different flight levels, which are the colors on the, the bottom graph. So that's the process that we were going through every six hours, altering the source uh, term from the volcano, using the latest meteorology, providing an updated advisory. But as the uh, event progressed, of course, and it became clear that there were going to be no fly zones all over the place, it, it, the question then became, well, can you tell us how much ash? Because actually we think certain amounts of ash are quite safe to fly in. And you, that sounds quite a trivial thing to do, but actually it's a massive amount of science that had to be done in about five days um, to come up with going from there is some ash here to knowing how much ash um, and, and at what level. So we had to go very quickly from a chart that looked like that to a chart that looked like that and we had two at this stage, two ash concentrations, um, two times 10 to the minus three and uh, 20 milligrams per meter cubed. And um, that that then became the standard, but of course, what does it represent? Does it represent the mean ash concentrations through the depth of the atmosphere, or does it represent the maximum concentration that an aircraft could encounter? They're different things. And actually, these were actually the peak concentrations, um, and they were very well uh, validated against observations. So the other challenge with all of this was, of course, 
uh, knowing where the ash was, observing the ash, knowing how good your forecasts were. And this became quite a, a contentious issue as time progressed, that observing ash is non-trivial also. You can't fly into it with a typical research aircraft because they've got jet engines. Uh, you can use other sensors like satellites or you can use lidars and so forth, but they're not direct measurements of mass concentrations. You have to infer them from the scattering properties of the ash, which means you fundamentally you assume that the particles are spherical, but of course they're not. And so again, you would have no accurate measurements of ash concentrations or even particle size. But nevertheless, there's a lot you can do, and this is an example of the uh, valid, validation of an ash forecast this time in, into May. And what you can see here in the satellites is an enhanced satellite image. Um, you can see the plume leaving uh, Iceland. And then a lot of this ash is being recirculated in this high pressure system that sat over the North Atlantic for all this period whilst this uh, emergency was going on. And you can even see that the uh, if we go down to the next image here, which was what we were asked to do, not only to have red and black zones, but finally to have red, gray, and dark gray zones, um, that the, most, the highest concentrations of ash are actually being quite well captured by the dispersion model. So provided you knew what was coming out of the volcano, then the weather forecast model and the dispersion model could give you a very accurate description of where the ash went and where the gradients in ash concentration were likely to be. So this whole business of pulling together satellite retrievals and the dispersion model calculations is very critical. Of course, one of the things that we learnt from the Eiffel uh, example is the importance of carrying old ash in dispersion models. And we had some quite uh, interesting conversations with other dispersion groups at that time who normally don't carry ash more than, for more than a couple of days because most of the time volcanic ash particles are big enough that they drop out. But in this particular example, because there was so much fine ash coming out of this volcano, that the lifetime was actually certainly up to five days. And you can see this here, the old ash recirculating in that high pressure system. So the whole business of actually carrying old ash was very important for this particular case. And the other thing that we learned about this was that the ash was becoming highly stratified in the vertical. That again, because we were in a very stratified, stable flow regime with this anticyclone, the ash was stratifying into layers of quite high concentrations, but quite thin layers. And this again is very challenging if you're trying to advise aviation of where they can or cannot fly. And this is, a, this is just a very nice example from some ground-based observations we had over the UK showing very clearly the presence of the ash layer and it descending slowly over time and mixing into the boundary layer. And again, here you can use um, some quite uh, more sophisticated techniques to be able to identify the ash as opposed to clouds, because again, what some of the issues are, are we really observing ash? But actually, its polarization characteristics are quite distinct from cloud droplets, and that we were able to use that to identify the ash layers. But of course, the biggest source of uncertainty is the source term in all of this, and that's where having to, working with the volcanologists was so important. And this was a, a forced marriage that we had. We, I got to know a lot of people I didn't know before. Uh, this happened from the British Geological Survey from Bristol University and Steve Sparks, who very kindly, uh, I think, proposed me for this presentation. All sorts of people that I didn't know. Um, we were forced to work together very, very rapidly in the space of a few days. So it became very rapidly a multidisciplinary science program. Um, and I think, it, 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 as we'll see later, it's, it's a, um, although you wouldn't want to have this happen to you too often because it was a, an exhausting episode, the process of being forced to work together was really, really uh, crucial. So here we're looking at the emission characteristics. This is our biggest source of uncertainty. Uh, our current way of representing 
releases of uh, uh, volcanic ash in our dispersion model is in the top here. Very simple, no difference in the vertical. It's a column and it gets dispersed. And you can look at all sorts of more sophisticated ways of describing it. Um, and probably the best way is some probabilistic approach, which is what we're currently investigating. Because fundamentally, what you're having to deal with is an emission source that can go from looking like that, that's the peak of its eruption, to an emission source that looks like that. And uh, what we're really interested in, of course, from the point of view of, of the dispersion modeling is perhaps not what's coming out of the volcano directly at the volcano, but what is actually exiting the area about 100 kilometers downwind because at that point, a lot of the big stuff has settled out and actually very, very, very rapidly, as you can see in these images, actually the plume becomes quite stratified and laminated. And this is what you really want to put into your dispersion model. So understanding the dynamics of volcanic plumes is also quite critical to this problem. And it's a, a, a serious fluid dynamics problem of understanding how does a plume uh, from a volcano form structures like this and how can we model that and then feed that into our, our atmospheric dispersion models. So that's one of the uh, other big challenges we faced. The other thing of course is that we didn't actually know what the particle size distribution was of this stuff. Um, we had a few measurements from aircraft that could fly into the ash layers um, and we had some uh, LIDAR, radar uh, measurements, but very, we knew very, very little about the size of the ash particles. And did it matter? Well, actually, as it turns out, we were running typically in the uh, 10 to 30 micron range was what we were using in the dispersion model. And this is a nice sensitivity study that was done subsequently that showed that actually um, provided, provided you don't, uh, provided the particles are reasonably fine, it doesn't really matter too much. It's only when they get significantly over 30 microns that you can, re you can produce major errors in your dispersion calculation. So this again, it's another part of the uncertainty that you need to factor in to your forecasts. So what we're moving to now, rather than having one forecast for where we think the ash is and how much ash there is, is to something that's much more based on a risk category for threshold exceedance. So we now work with the engine manufacturers and understand what they believe to be safe limits of ash and produce probabilistic type forecasts. And this is one for one example for flight level from the surface to uh, 20,000 feet. Um, an example of the sorts of things we could produce um, and the likelihood of being above a certain concentration of ash. And this is quite useful. You can look at it in lots of different ways. So we can take Storn away, for example, and look at it in time and look where you might have high probability if you were flying around Storn away of exceeding dangerous levels of ash. And I think this is the sort of product that we're gradually going to have to move towards and much more discretization in the vertical. Or another way that you might pr present it um, would be something like this, where you would look again at the uh, probability of exceeding a certain ash concentration. So the red, gray, and black are similar to the colors I was showing earlier on. So this is how we're going to have to move forward with this. And I think what we got out of this was that we learned during this whole process about how to put some of those pieces together that I talked about earlier on. We were forced to very rapidly. Um, and what we can learn, take from this is that some bits of the puzzle are, are more mature than others. And this is a, the sort of way in which we could look at many of these geophysical hazards is to think about the whole sequence of things that we need to know to be able to, to make a confident assessment of risk and to then look at where the gaps and uncertainties, the major gaps and uncertainties are. And this is what we learnt just within a month of having to deal with Eofiocal, that there were some things 
particularly the formation of the suspended ash plume, which is a major uncertainty. We also learned that actually we need to know a lot more about the ash cloud properties. So it was clear that uh, there was some agglomeration of the ash and these bigger particles were dropping out. Um, but we don't really understand the process and we certainly don't know how to model it in our atmospheric dispersion model. But it might be crucial for getting the right concentrations and particle sizes some way downwind. So this is a sort of, in a way, a microcosm of the sorts of things that we as a community have to do as we go forward. What I want to do now is to just talk through much more quickly uh, a couple of examples from other geophysical hazards and give you a flavor of, from this summer, from particularly this summer, and give you a flavor of where we're getting to with our weather and climate prediction because the, as I've said, a lot of these start with weather and they rec if we can make uh, skillful predictions of weather, then we have a solid foundation on which to build a more complete estimate of the geophysical hazard and the geophysical risk. So let's look at the Pakistan floods. I think this is a really good example of changing exposure. This wasn't an unprecedented event. It, may, it was a very serious event, but there had been flooding as bad um, in the early part of the 20th century. But of course, what we have now is a much larger population and a large population living along the riverbanks in Pakistan. Um, and also, many of these very severe events are just part of the natural variability of the weather. So this is a very, another very important point, is that um, it's very easy for people to say, well, isn't this climate change? Well, sometimes there may be an element of climate change, but most of the time this is just an, a, a conjunction, a natural conjunction of weather systems uh, that happen or uh, a type of weather pattern that occurs that is not that unusual. So the Pakistan floods was the conjunction of two weather systems. We had a very strong monsoon running last year, particularly during that part of into July and so forth, and we had quite a well-developed monsoon trough, which you can see in the lower tropospheric winds in the top panel here. And um, Let's see if I can use the pointer a bit. And we can see the winds uh, flowing around the top of the northern flank of the monsoon trough and into, into northern Pakistan here. This is a very well-developed monsoon trough. And we also had a monsoon depression coming into southern Pakistan there. At the same time, we had a very disturbed mid-latitude flow this summer uh, associated with the developing La Nina in the tropical Pacific and a very pronounced block again over the North Atlantic. So what we had was a sequence of weather systems that ran a long way south. We had high pressure over Russia, a downstream trough, high pressure here, another trough here. Um, again, not hugely unusual, but quite unusual. And if we look at this in a bit more detail, we can see that what happened was that the normal position of the subtropical jet, which guides the weather systems, this is its normal position, well to the north of the uh, Tibetan plateau in summer and well to the north of Pakistan, was very disturbed this year, came a long way south, made this enormous uh, turned south here into the Mediterranean. We had this blocking anticyclone here, and then the jet itself made this excursion into northern Pakistan, a very strong jet leaving Pakistan there. And what that meant was that the interaction of the monsoon flow here, this is India here, this is two days, quite well separated, but very, very similar meteorological situation. Peninsular India here, this is the the jet here, the trough is upstream of the convection here. This is the thunderstorms that formed on the mountains in western Pakistan, interacting with the low-level moist flow from the monsoon trough, interacting with the leading edge of this upper-level trough. It's a classic situation for convective instability and very, very heavy thunderstorms. 
And we can see that situation persisted. Here's the 29th of July, almost exactly the same situation uh, quite a few days later. And uh, we have, we know that very large amounts of rain from the limited observations that are available, very large amounts of rain coming out of this system. So in Peshawar, for example, reporting 249 millimeters in 24 hours on the 25th, uh, Drosh to the north, 125 millimeters in 24 hours and so forth. And actually I have some, uh, I have a personal interest in this because my older daughter who's in the audience actually, uh, went off on a, a five week trek with some young people from the UK as the uh, doctor in charge to Ladakh and she called me from Ladakh soon after they arrived and said what on earth is going on with the weather? It's raining and the passes are all filled with snow and the locals are saying we don't know what on earth is going on here, we've never seen anything like it. And I sort of said well you know you probably get out in the next day or two but you should be prepared for more of this because it looks like that sort of season. And uh, indeed it was, and she had a pretty exciting time, and I was very glad to see her home after five weeks. But here just uh, are some of her photographs from Ladakh, which is a bit further over than Western Pakistan and the headwaters of the Indus, but was equally badly affected. And the main town of Leh quite badly damaged, a lot of it uh, washed away or whatever. And this is just an example of what she experienced, which was cloud bursts around the hill, the mountains, thunderstorms, massive thunderstorms, huge um, bursts of rain that came uh, down these mountain rivers, washing away everything in its, in its wake, uh, all the bridges and so forth between the communities. And here we are with, uh, again, roads washed away, massive mudslides, buildings just tumbled, and great rocks moved, trees thrown everywhere. So this was a pretty violent event. These were major, major storms that happened over the mountains. And the question is, could they have been predicted? Well, we were in touch with the Pakistan Met Service right from the very beginning of this crisis and providing them with forecasts from our, what we call our crisis area model, which is a 12 kilometer model we use in many parts of the world. And uh, the accumulations here for the 29th of July are really quite staggering. These are six hour accumulations and we're up at 64 millimeters and beyond with these colors. The value of this, of course, is that you could um, have fed this into a hydrology model and looked at the impact in the subsequent days and weeks of, of what would, would be the effect on the Indus as these, this massive amount of rain moved down the river system. We can't observe this amount of rain very easily. You could see the sparsity of the rain gauge, but we could use these sorts of, this sort of modeling now, which is getting to the level at which it becomes incredibly useful to link up with the hydrology and we could have, I think, have used this sort of model, modeling and these sorts of forecasts to tell us about uh, the, the impact on the Indus and the flooding. And even looking further ahead, and this is a result from ECMWF, uh, even nine days ahead, because of the setup of the meteorology, the probability of exceeding 100 millimeters over four days, is not insignificant and we need to learn how to use this sort of information and link that too with the geophysical hazard models um, to give us an idea of the, the sorts of risks that were likely to uh, affect uh, the country as in the subsequent days. So the point here is that even though this was very extreme rainfall, there is something already that we can do and actually could do to make a difference. Right, now I'll just move on very quickly. Um, to the Russian heat wave because actually this is where we've, we've looked at changing vulnerability, we've looked at changing exposure and I think now we could possibly be looking at changing climate. And uh, the Russian heat wave again associated with a weather system that does occur, this again was one of these persistent atmospheric blocking events, um, but it really was quite a dramatic uh, 
uh, heat wave. Here are the temperature anomalies for the latter part of July, um, and they certainly got up to um, 12 degrees C or more for that week. And uh, it's getting into, well, very similar, in fact, to the, to the European heat wave of 2003 in its intensity and its impact. So again, you can ask, well, could we have forecast this? And this, was actually, this is actually quite an interesting result um, that we hadn't sort of particularly looked at in the Met Office until I said, well, I, I, I'm going to talk about this. And I'd like to know, could we have made a seasonal forecast? It's the sort of thing you think, well, the seasonal forecast just wouldn't be very good at. Um, but actually, this was quite an interesting result. So this was our May seasonal forecast for July. So this is two months in advance. And these were the uh, temperature anomalies from an ensemble mean. So this is a whole set of forecasts. And even in the ensemble mean, there's a warm signal. And you can see the square, which is the main affected region, and Moscow in the middle there. And if we plot the distribution, though, of temperatures for that green box uh, from, from those various seasonal forecasts, actually, you, you find something quite interesting. First of all, the forecasts are really, the distribution of forecasts is quite separate from the hindcasts. So there was a signal here, actually, uh, that we could have used. The, uh, we can see the PDF here is, 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 is definitely outside most of the forecasts away outside or at least within the tail of the normal distribution from all the hindcasts. So this isn't a model that normally runs warm for Russia. So this was a signal that could be detected. And if we look at those two outliers here, the warmest ones, giving us anything between five or six degrees, and look at the distributions of temperatures against what was observed here and the two outliers here, you see that actually the model has captured not only the right intensity, but to some degree the right sort of structure. It's clearly associated with a weather pattern. It's clearly associated with a blocking regime. And so we could have said, I think, that uh, going forward, I think we need to look at our seasonal forecasts in a more meteorological way and move away from looking at things like tersiles and, and um, deciles and so forth and actually look at them in terms of meteorology and interpret them, use them to drive a geophysical hazard model. We could have taken these seasonal forecasts and pushed them through then into uh, something to do with uh, air quality, wildfires, etc., etc. There is real skill here now in some of these models. And equally, just to make the final point, that the circulation patterns here are clearly associated with blocking and downstream troughs. We have real skill, I think, emerging now out of these models when we look at large-scale uh, variables like temperature. It's certainly not the case that if I looked at the Pakistan floods, that the seasonal forecast would capture those because of the scale of the systems involved and the intensity of the rainfall that was involved. We don't have the resolution in these models yet to do that problem, but it will come, I hope. But I think that the message here is that uh, there is real potential now emerging to, to do more in terms of geophysical uh, risk assessment going forward from the sorts of models that we're using for weather forecast and climate prediction. Just finally, the attribution of the Russian heat wave and why possibly we have to start thinking about climate change. Yes, it was a, a blocking event, and this is from a nice paper by Marty Hurling at NOAA, um, that the pattern of temperatures um, associated with the block are very similar but in July 2010, they're just that bit more intense. So if we look at the July temperatures here, July blocking days over the last 50 years, there were blocks before, quite a lot of blocking in the early 70s, but the temperatures were not nearly as high. And this is kind of the story we were getting also with the European heat wave in 2003, that the heat wave was just part of natural variability uh, 
that was being amplified potentially by global warming. And so this is something that, again, we have to start working into our modeling. So finally, um, what I, I think where we are now in terms of geophysical hazards is that we are heading towards this much more seamless approach to a lot of what we do in terms of forecasting. This is a system that we've implemented in the Met Office now where we have the same modeling system running from our very short-term weather forecast right out to our long-term climate change. And I think a lot of the science that surrounds geophysical hazards is also seamless in the sense that weather and climate are seamless systems. So I think a lot of the work that we do in geophysical hazards uh, related to impacts now are equally valid for how we would look at impacts in a changing climate uh, 10, 20, 30, 40 years on. So this concept of seamless science is something that I think many of us would like to see carried through. Um, and if we can understand the impacts and build resilience, as I say now, then we can become more adaptable in the future. I think we still have an issue of bridging the gaps and bridging the scales. Uh, that as communities, we're not joined up. And we saw that with the volcanic ash incident. And we see that very often in the way in which we are able to communicate or not, that people whose science works down at this very fine scale have very great difficulty talking to those of us who work at the 50 to 100 kilometer scale. So we still have a lot to do in terms of bridging the scales, many orders of magnitude, several orders of magnitudes in terms of scales. But I think, again, we are at, a, at the cusp of a I think a new era where the scales of the models that we use to define our weather and climate are getting to the sorts of scales that can interface with those of you who work down at these much more local um, scales. And just uh, finally, to give you a little flavor of, of what I mean, this is, uh, again, another natural hazard that we had in the UK last year in this case was the Cumbrian floods. And uh, this was, as far as we can tell, an unprecedented event, certainly going back over one or two centuries. And we know that not only from the observational record, but also because bridges that had stood for several centuries were washed away. Um, and what we were able to do at the office for the first time, I think, really, was to put out a weather forecast or a red alert warning which goes to the uh, Cabinet Office and to the Prime Minister. Uh, we were able to put that out two days in advance for severe flooding in the uh, Cumbrian district. And this was a pretty bold forecast, and I doubt we would have made this uh, two or three years ago. And this was the forecast for in excess of 200 millimeters of rain on the Cumbrian Fells. And this is what actually happened. It was between two and 300 millimeters of rain. It was an unprecedented event. And the reason we were able to do that is because we're now running our models at these sorts of scales. This is a one and a half kilometer model that we now run operationally four times a day. And we're getting to the scale, of course, which means something to a hydrologist. So we now have, in the UK, a flood forecasting center which brings together meteorology and hydrology. And it works because we can run now our weather forecasting models and produce rainfall scenarios that are what actually a hydrologist really needs. And this is just an example here. Here is the forecasting for the Cockermouth floods. We had strong southwesterly flow. These are model simulations of clouds, um, and this is the simulation of rain rates, and we're up in the 16 millimeters per hour rain rates as this southwesterly flow impinged on the mountains of, of the Lake District. Here's another example from an earlier flooding event in Morpeth, which is on the uh, north coast of England. But again, showing again the skill of when we're down at these sorts of scales of one and a half kilometers, here we can see convective cells as this depression winds itself up. Convective cells forming on the front in the model 
um, and propagating into northern England here in a great stream of heavy rain events. These are these pluvial flooding events which we increasingly see and we really do need to be able to simulate the very high intensity rain rates. So where this takes us I think is, is to a situation where we are now that where I think it's really meaningful to actually try and combine geophysical hazards in a complete system and this is kind of my vision of where I would like the Met Office to be in the next few years um, where not only for weather forecasting because this is our current system we run 20 kilometers globally one kilometer over the UK where I'd like to be to do seasonal impacts to do climate change impacts so this is the challenge for us is to to get the science and the resources to be able to run globally at these sorts of resolutions on many t for many times feed those into our regional predictions at one kilometer to get the local meteorology which allows you then to do the impact uh, and the hazard and the risk assessment and I don't think this is an impossible dream I think this is achievable within the f next five to ten years so if I come back to uh, the picture I had at the beginning and I've just changed it very slightly and I put some colors onto it to sort of show you where we are I think in terms of the meteorology we've made remarkable progress in the last few years and being able to to predict weather and climate extremes not just tomorrow or, ne or the next few days but maybe even out to a season or even a decade ahead and we can relate those now I think much more meaningfully to other, other science areas in geophysics because we are now actually working at the sorts of scales that really allow us to, to relate, to inter integrate the science in the way that we saw with the volcano and the way that we can see with a flood forecasting uh, center that we now run at the Met Office. But we've still got masses to do. We don't really understand the, the links through these different pathways to eventually getting us to quantifying and reducing risk and that's where we need to interact with very different communities not just in geophysics but in social sciences economic sciences working with those sectors who understand very, risk very well like the insurance sector and the financial sectors and of course all of this has to be within a probabilistic framework so we need to accept that this is, there will never be a deterministic answer to any of this. We need to embed probabilities deeply into the science that we do across all of geophysics. So finally, some concluding remarks. Um, geophysical hazards, as I've shown, cross many disciplines and many scales in space and time. It's a very, very challenging problem. Many of these hazards are caused by or mediated through weather and climate extremes. But I think that progress depends on that integration across disciplines of, I've talked mainly about modeling today and predictions, but of course, integration across disciplines of observations and monitoring. One should never neglect the fact that we need really good observations and we need to monitor the environment in which we live. Analysis of those observations and modeling of the system, predictions and impact assessments, we need to handle and communicate uncertainties in a much uh, more uh, clear and transparent and robust way. I have to say, and everybody who's heard me speak on anything recently to do with prediction, weather and climate prediction, that there is so much more we could do if we had access to the sort of supercomputing power we need to do this problem properly. You've seen that we have capabilities to run these models at very fine resolutions. There is capability there in a lot of the seasonal forecasting if we can run large enough ensembles and so on and so forth. Um, and the, uh, many of the geophysical models that will have to interact with the meteorological models, they also require massive supercomputing super power to do the job properly. So the science, I think the science is far ahead of our ability often to deliver it for society. So 
we as a community need to keep pushing for more supercomputing power to deal with these problems of natural hazards. And finally, of course, one shouldn't forget that dialogue with the end user is absolutely vital. We need to be sure that what we produce and the way we think a risk should be presented is what the end user can understand and is what they want. And often, actually, I find interacting with end users uh, very stimulating. They challenge the science. They challenge the way in which we interpret our forecasts. Um, and they bring a lot of freshness to the subject. So I think on that note, I will conclude um, by saying that what, of course, we need is a natural hazards prediction service. And uh, in the UK, in the Met Office, we're working very actively now um, to develop a natural hazards partnership with a whole range of disciplines around the UK so that we can actually make progress on this problem. So thank you for listening and um, have a nice evening and have, have a late dinner. <laughs> thank you. Are there any questions for Julia? Yes. Yes, certainly when we come to looking at uh, things like season, seasonal longer-term forecasting, longer-term predictions, it's very much an international activity. That example was actually from our own model, but I think it's really important that we bring a lot of these things together. In terms of the, uh, I mean, the volcanic ash incident, uh, there was a huge amount of international collaboration and exchange of, of model results. So this is, this is a really, we do need to tackle this as an international problem, as an international group. Absolutely. How long have you got, Guy? <laughs> I mean, you're, you're absolutely right, which is why, you know, the lines going from even, even if you had the, dealt with the exposure vulnerability, how do you get people to act is incredibly difficult. And you need the right sort of structures. Um, and we don't have them. Um, I think, though, the point I was trying to make is that um, even without those structures, I sense there's so much more we could do if we as a science community were more integrated. So even the Pakistan f flooding example, uh, where we were working with the Pakistan Met Service and providing them with rainfall forecasts, think how much more one could have, we could have done if we had known that there was a hydrological community out there who could take those rainfall scenarios and run them through a hydrological model. I think we need, we clearly need some international frameworks for this and I think that the, was the uh, outcome for the global framework for climate services which is where that will go. I think that's a long way away because actually uh, even for ourselves we have to find our way around this pathway ourselves as scientists. I don't think an international framework will solve the problem. I think we as scientists, as in the way that we had to with the volcanic ash example, we were forced to work together. We've got to find a way to, 
to develop more interdisciplinary science to really do that, bridge that gap between the weather and climate to the geophysical hazard, which is why in that diagram I put an orange arrow, that even as something as basic as that, we don't do well. Um, it's not a very complete answer, but uh, I think, I think uh, a good start, let's start with our own community and let's do better there, and then I think we'll be in a better position to influence the, uh, the wider international scene. I'd like to thank Julia again and um, wish everybody a good evening.